Thank you, Emily. Uh, thank you everyone for being here tonight. Um, please, I'll just say from the beginning, use the chat as we go. We'll be monitoring the chat. We'll be elevating your questions and comments and thoughts. And um, I'm just so excited to see so many of you here um, to learn more about our rubric and how to use it in the judging context. I'm Donna Phillips, the Vice President and Chief Program Officer here at the Center. And you'll hear from Emily a lot uh, in a second, but with me is Emily, our Senior Manager for uh, National Programs and Professional Development. And, um, and really the key uh, organizer of our rubric update. So um, lots, of, lots of energy went into this. So we're gonna go to the next slide. Yeah, so we'll... Um, you can go ahead and throw your name in the chat while we're kind of orienting ourselves to what our session tonight is about, just so we can see who's here and you can say hi to one another in the chat. Um, what we're gonna do tonight is walk through the new rubric, uh, kind of a high level overview, but then we're actually gonna dive right into each criteria to make sure everyone understands what that criteria means um, and why we have it, what, what that looks like in, uh, in the students' responses and in a competition setting. You're gonna have a chance to listen to a competition and watch a competition and apply the rubric. Um, this rubric does something really exciting, which is it uh, really sets us up for a new way to think about follow-up questions and the type of conversation you will have with the students um, during the hearing. And so you'll get a chance to practice that and you'll learn some of the new strategies that are baked right into uh, the rubric and the hearing process itself. And then um, all along the way, we will answer your questions and clarify as we go. And this is just the beginning of uh, our, our, first, our first interaction with our wonderful judges um, across the country. Uh, we'll have plenty more resources for you, but we're so happy you're here with us tonight. Oh, yep. See, I always jump ahead of myself. Please use the chat. <laughs> All right. So um, uh, some of you have been with us in some of our previous webinars. So I know this may, uh, you could probably recite some of this by heart <laughs> by now. But as you know, um, over the last several years, and maybe even you know for a while before that, um, we the old rubric always presented certain challenges um, to really getting at measuring the student learning and their deep constitutional knowledge. And so last year, we endeavored to really capture that feedback um, anecdotally and qualitatively and quantitatively. Um, we had surveys and stakeholder engagements and conversations with many of you. Uh, if you judged at national finals, you might remember getting a survey at the end uh, or national invitational asking you uh, your thoughts on the rubric and how it might be improved. Uh, we also worked very closely with our state coordinators and then our We the People teachers because the rubric has to serve not just the competition or a showcase, it also serves a very important instructional uh, purpose. Um, so we had a, a wonderful committee that came together. They included board members from the Center for Civic Ed, teachers, members of our scoring team who assist us at national finals, alumni um, and state coordinators and many people who actually serve multiple of those roles. And so some of them are on our call tonight and you'll be able to hear from them as well. And they serve as kind of like experts now on this new rubric and how to use it. Uh, so big shout out to uh, Hank, Sean, Trish, Beth, Don, Michael, well, Emily and myself, but this is what we get paid to do, so. <laughs> um, so just to highlight our process, we, we took the feedback, as we mentioned, we reviewed other rubrics for similar purposes, um, everything from advanced placement rubrics, mock trial rubrics, ones that are used in elementary we looked at adaptations of the traditional We the People rubric and how it's been used across decades and in different states at different levels. We, um, what we really wanted to figure out is, you know, how can we establish criteria 
that when a teacher is using it to guide students in their learning and their writing of their speeches and practicing of their follow-ups really gets to what we believe to be the best uh, civic education and that deep constitutional learning. So we had a lot of discussions about what that criteria might look like um, and how in crafting the rubric, it can be used in the classroom for competitive and non-competitive hearings at different grade levels. Um, and then of course at national finals. We sent out multiple drafts, uh, the different groups for feedback, and then we landed on our final draft. Um, and having, uh, having said that, after this year, we will still continue to solicit and make use of feedback and make any tweaks and modifications that uh, seem to come as we use it for this full year of implementation. But I just wanna emphasize uh, tonight's webinar is focused on how to use it in a competition or showcase setting as judges. Um, and you all know that as judges and, and people who, who support the simulated congressional hearings, this really is an embodiment of a long journey for the students and their teacher um, to really showcase everything they've learned. Because what has happened preceding the showcases and the competitions is really amazing civic education in the classroom. And so first and foremost, this rubric is an instructional tool and it really back maps into the instructional decisions teachers make to prepare their students. We think that the new criteria uh, highlights and reinforces civic education best practices. And we've had so, uh, previous webinars where we talked to teachers and others um, about how the rubric itself is, is implemented in the classroom. And we do think that this really just captures uh, our, best, our best ideas about deep constitutional and civic education. Um, again, as I said, we, we think that it is a, a great new tool that highlights an opportunity for students to grow and get multiple rounds of feedback. Um, we, we worked really hard to make so that the rubric itself could be used instructionally in the classroom and also uh, still very elegantly in the competition setting. There's a lot of other supports that we have for competition itself, such as um, downloadable forms and a um, Excel spreadsheet version of the rubric that can be used during the actual competition. But the way the rubric is structured allows for feedback that continues to allow students to grow. And we do, we have been reinforcing the message that your role as judges is very important. And at every level, except for national finals, students make use of your feedback and apply it to the next thing that they do and the next level of competition or even just the next unit they learn in class. By the time we get to national finals, they want their feedback, uh, but that's their terminal place. And so you continue to use the rubric um, and the teachers take the feedback and improve their own instruction. You'll see new sections such as the comment section, um, guidance for how to think about the criteria. And one of the biggest changes uh, is the separation of the opening statement as its own discrete category for evaluation separate from the follow-ups. Oh, and there's last, the last thing I'll emphasize is that you will recognize the traditional criteria from the old rubric all throughout this new rubric. So there's nothing new about what it is we're looking for. What's new is how we're looking for it and how we're hoping to capture it in a more authentic way. Okay, thanks, Donna. Um, I just posted in the chat the page on the Civic Ed website where the rubric lives. Um, this is the same page where you will find this year's state hearing questions. Um, so if you would like to follow along, and I realize that if you are on Zoom on your phone, this part will be difficult. But if you are on a laptop or desktop and you want to take a look at the rubric as we are walking through it, um, you certainly can. So the rubric is the second item on the bullet pointed list on the website right underneath high school state hearing questions but we'll show segments that we're talking about for those of you who, who cannot um, access it at this time. Okay, so the first thing I wanna talk about is the design. So this is a very different design than the rubric that we have all become familiar with over the years. Um, we created a rubric that 
really emphasizes the feedback for the students. And so we list the expectations that we are looking for in the different criteria um, down the center column of the rubric. And then on the left side are uh, spaces where judges can indicate opportunities for growth. And on the right side are opportunities for you to give kudos to the students uh, in areas where they have exceeded expectations. So the, these little spots will be found on each of the, uh, the different um, categories that we'll talk about. Um, so each of the categories then also has a score box highlighted. Um, and then of course there's a total score option down at the bottom. And so it's, if you see the color version, <laughs> this is highlighted in yellow so that you can see right there, this is the score for this particular category. All right, and then the check boxes down the center. We're gonna dig into this a little bit further, uh, but the check boxes are meant as kind of a, a quick and easy assessment for you to determine, have, has the student met this general expectation of this category? Like I said, we're gonna dive into this more deeply, but if you are sitting in a competition setting and you have heard that all the students have participated, you can give it a quick check mark and you will know that the student has met that particular expectation. All right, so about those check boxes, um, just a quick reminder, these don't get scored individually. So they're for each of the five categories, you will see three check boxes per category. Um, so you can just use these to keep track as you go. Um, the students are not expected to reference every single example we provided. The examples uh, simply list things that you might expect to hear. Over the process of a hearing, you can go about using a highlighter or a pen to highlight examples that you heard the students reference, or you certainly can do what you have done for all of your other previous hearing experiences, which is take notes on a legal pad or a notepad and simply transfer your notes to the rubric following the hearing. So that's gonna be where you you know, list out, hey, kudos for that great example um, of a Supreme Court case, or you know, it would have been really great if you were a little more specific about what you meant in this particular example, things like that. Um, but you are absolutely not expected to ditch your previous note-taking method. <laughs> this is just meant to help guide you and if you want to move things a little bit more quickly. Okay, so the students will be evaluated in five categories. We previously had six. Um, the five categories being the opening statement, evidence, analysis, and understanding, application, and discussion. Each uh, category is scored out of 10 points, same as the old one. And so your total score at this point is out of 50. And so each category is thus worth 20% of the final score. All right, so we'll spend some time here getting to know the different categories. The first one, as Donna mentioned, the opening statement. So this is one of the biggest structural changes in the rubric, and the opening statement is meant to be scored completely separately. And there's a variety of, of reasons that we chose to do this, which we will dig in momentarily. Um, but with the opening statement, we are, of course, looking for the basics. Have the students answered all the elements of the question? Have all the students participated in giving the presentation of the opening statement? And have the students taken a well-organized logical approach to the statement using appropriate references to any number of different things, including the constitution, scholarly sources, case law, historical documents, or other materials relevant to their subject matter. Um, so as I said, that's it. This is just the opening statement, um, not the follow-ups. So, why have we elected to separate the opening statement? This was actually one of the most recommended changes from the feedback that we received initially. And there's 
a variety of reasons that we would do this, but I think at the at the core, we do want to recognize that the writing of the opening statement does take work, that the students have, in theory, done a good amount of research to put it together in the first place. They worked as a team. They figured out how to edit the document down to a four-minute verbal statement. However, it's just the beginning. <laughs> and we also recognize that this is the portion of the hearing process that is unfortunately most likely to have influence from outside aid. Um, whether that happens to be a lot of coaching from adults or whether that happens to be questions that they fed into chat GPT or some similar product that have spit out an answer. I mean, it will be evident to you as it always is, as soon as you get into the follow-up questions, you know exactly how much work they did. <laughs> but because we have no way of knowing how they crafted the opening statement, the best we can do is say, okay, you've clearly put some work into this, you've met our expectations, and then we can move on. But this is the reason the opening statement is separated out. All right, so the following four categories then become based upon the follow-up period. So the first thing I'm going to, to reference uh, Hank Chambers and Hank can hop in if I'm uh, abusing my, uh, my assessment of his thoughts. But there is a great shorthand way that Hank thought about these three categories in the, the center of the rubric that I think is helpful to everyone to hear. Okay, evidence in brief what does the Constitution or the other historical document or the quote or whatever issue is at the crux of that uh, initial question, what does it say? <laughs> so we're looking here for students to be referencing constitutional text, principles, primary and secondary sources to let us know that they understand what that document says. They might reference historical events or figures if it's relevant. They might provide current day examples if it's relevant. And I do really want to highlight here that throughout the rubric, we have used the language constitutional principles, small c, um, instead of relying exclusively on reference to the US Constitution, big C, because not every question lends itself to an easy connection to the US Constitution Big C. This has long been a challenge for students in units one and six particularly, um, but we have uh, crafted the rubric to highlight constitutional principles um, so that students who are in those other situations can not necessarily be penalized for not making those direct textual references. All right, so evidence, what does it say? <laughs> All right, uh, next category, the analysis understanding category. And the shorthand here is what does it mean? <laughs> so now we're looking for whatever the crux of that question was, um, have students actually analyzed and more uh, more deeply understood the issues at play in this question, document, statement, et cetera. So have they referenced judicial uh, decisions, um, any historical context that might help explain this particular issue at the question's core? Um, we are really looking for here whether students have recognized multiple perspectives on constitutional issues. And that could include everything from dissenting opinions, alternative arguments, um, but just seeing that there's, there's different folks that can explain um, what it means. And lastly, um, have students identified potential consequences of some of those things? So what does the document mean and according to who? So that's our, our handy shorthand there. All right, and then finally we have uh, application. So the shorthand, how does our understanding of the document or the issue or the case at the crux of the question, how does it apply? So 
Now we're looking for um, potential court interpretations, but public policies that might have resulted from a court interpretation. Um, how have potential arguments changed over the course of time? How might we now understand or apply an issue differently than it was originally applied, um, if it's a historical example? And students might also apply the, the issue or the question um, potentially to other countries or other historical time periods. So this is um, allowing for the possibility of students, um, again, in units one and six, to be able to reference influences from Britain, um, uh, other examples from philosophers of continental Europe, um, or unit six students to be able to talk about influences of the US constitution on constitutions worldwide or vice versa. Um, these are just examples. So as I said, we're not expecting to have every single unit student answer every single one of those examples. That would be a thesis. <laughs> These are examples of what we might expect. All right, and then the final category is discussion. So those of you who have done this for a long time um, have been well-versed <laughs> with the, uh, the question of participation. And participation was a challenge for a lot of us um, because it really just required the students to say something, not necessarily say something substantive. So we've all sat across a, the panel from you know, students who have said, I agree with my colleague. I disagree with my colleague. <laughs> and that might be all we hear out of each of those children, um, but technically they participated. So when we thought through how we wanted to include discussion and participation, what we decided that we were really most interested in was how substantive the discussion became. And so have the students demonstrated a level of intellectual engagement with you? Um, have you heard from at least most of the students on the panel? Um, have students continued to provide the logical, the well thought out reasoning for their positions? Um, is the evidence they're giving you correct or is it kind of loose? <laughs> and have students connected their follow-up to the opening statement? Now that's not something that we require, um, but I think a lot of us have experienced also uh, instances where students might take a suddenly completely different position than they uh, listed out in their opening statement, which can sometimes be confusing. Um, so all of this is to say, when you have that really, really good conversation with the students, like you know it when you see it, you can push them a little bit more deeply, you can uh, ask more um, wide ranging questions. That is really what we're looking for in a best case scenario um, with discussion. All right, so, that is, that's the, the categories of the rubric. Um, and at this point, I also want to point out that we worked on this over the summer, which was ahead of us working on the questions that we have produced for the state competition, and certainly ahead of where we are with uh, the national level competition questions. We have attempted to write the questions to help support the rubric categories. So we're you know, trying to help the students get set up for success here. Uh, but I'd like to just demonstrate as an example, the uh, one of the questions from this year's state um, competition list. So how did Brutus I and Federalist 10 assess the problem of factions and what were their proposed remedies to address the presence of factions? In that question alone, you have the opportunity for students to demonstrate evidence. So what does it say? What does Brutus I and Federalist 10 say in the first place? Um, what does it mean? So what were their proposed remedies <laughs> to address the presence of factions? And then with the sub bullets there, how did these ratification essayists views influence future interpretations of the nature of representation? In your opinion, which of these two has proven to be the most accurate in their assessment? Okay, so now we have an opportunity for students to apply 
um, the interpretation of Brutus I and Federalist 10 to the, the arc of time, <laughs> which have proven to be more accurate. So this is priming the students to work into those different types of categories. So then once you all get into the follow-up questions, then we know we have long recommended that your questions can and should start based on the student's presentation. Anything they bring up in the opening statement is fair game and a great start for further questions. You all can also, as always, create your own unique questions based on the content of questions the students have answered and then content within the unit itself and then suggested follow-up questions, which we will also continue to provide. And the follow-up questions, we are also building to support the rubric categories. So um, these have not yet fully been published. We're looking forward to publishing these next week for the state coordinators, um, but we'll give you a sneak peek here. So the questions, question one and question two, <laughs> you mentioned fill in the blank in your speech. Please expand on this as it relates to your unit topic. Question two, how does concept blank relate to concept blank? So if you were if you were a judge for the question that we just looked at with Brutus and Federalist 10, you could simply say, how does the concept of faction relate to the concept of political parties? Something like that. All right, and then we've provided some other ones here. Are there enduring lessons or insights from Brutus 1 and Federalist 10 that are relevant in today's political landscape? It's an application question. Are political parties factions? Why or why not? It's an analysis question. So no matter what question you'll be asking, we're providing follow-ups that help guide the possibility that the students will be um, able to answer in those different categories. Okay. Emily, do we want to pause? Yes, absolutely. Oh. Go right ahead. Do we want to pause here and see if there are any questions uh, before we go into the next part? Sure. Um, I'll take a quick look at the chat here. Um, pa Patrick asked, um, is the PDF version default or will we be filling out elect be filling out the score forms electronically? Um, and the answer is at national finals and invitational, you would complete electronic forms. Yes, absolutely. Your state and local competitions will depend on your coordinator. So they may or may not use a paper form versus an electronic form. It's different in each state. And Cheryl has offered that California will use um, job forms. So the, the state coordinators have been very, um, very generous sharing with each other uh, the electronic versions that they have created. Thank you to the state coordinators. Okay. Let, let me jump in for, for a second. Go ahead, Hank. It, it, Emily has done a fantastic job describing what we were trying to do. Let me add just one or two things. We were trying to get at the way judges seem to already talk about how to judge competitions. It, and we recognize that judges in some ways say, well, okay, I think one group was better than another. So one group is going to get a higher score and we'll just have to back into those results in X fashion. We're hoping that the way that we walk through the scoring means that it'll be just that much easier and more obvious why one group may have been stronger than another group. So we're really not trying to change things. We're trying to change things much. We're trying to reflect what the judges have always done. So that, that's one of the reasons why, why Emily's absolutely right. We do recognize that there can be some overlap. We, we, we understand that there's a little overlap between what does the document or what do the constitutional principles say? What do they mean and how do they apply? But generally speaking, it's easier, I think it's as easy or easier 
to think of it in that way as how we thought about it with the old with the old rubric. I think it's just more a little more intuitive. Um, in that vein, the questions, as Emily noted, the questions can be easier to ask because in some ways you're you're kind of following up from the opening statement. Whereas just asking them to go deeper on do you really understand what else the Constitution says or what other principles are relevant to the question? One, two, do you really know what those other pieces mean in answering the question? And three, hey, let's just think about a couple of applications and can you handle that? that that'll take you through the lion's share of time and may well make it that much easier to compare compare groups. So I'll, I'll stop with that. Thanks, Hank. That's super helpful. All right, uh, and Mary will uh, ask your question here. So should we focus on including something for both exceeding and growth, or is it okay if we are only able to note one side or the other? Um, and are the checked boxes in the center the main focus for the score, or should we also consider the depth of subject? Great questions on both counts. Um, you are not expected to provide comments if you don't have any um, if you don't have any you know bad things to to say I suppose or opportunities for growth to reference and you have nothing but glowing commentary then you can certainly just write down glowing commentary but um, I, I think if you are judging any level of student below the national final there is always going to be some kind of opportunity to provide them with constructive feedback. Um, and remember, you know, even, even if that particular team does not end up advancing to the national competition and you can provide them with, with useful feedback that they can apply to other areas, I think that's still worthwhile. Um, so I hope that answers that question there. <laughs> and then the check boxes in the center. So you certainly can use that to inform your score, but yes, you absolutely can also take into account the depth to which you have been able to push the students in those different categories. I think that's perfectly appropriate. Um, we'll talk about the, the scoring um, in a little bit. Um, and then Allison says, will judges be able to adjust scores as the day progresses if we are comparing groups? Okay, so I can speak to the national level competition. Um, and again, you know, with every state level competition, this might look slightly different, but we would highly recommend that we would have you all have the ability to adjust your score as you see however many teams you see that day. Um, because it's, it, you all know this situation as, as well as we do, you know, a judge might see 10 teams, you know, and, and think that things might shake out a certain way, but then they see the 11th team and maybe that, that skews the results. So um, I will also pick on Hank to answer this one because this is one of his favorite uh, favorite things to discuss about the judging process, but we would recommend that you be able to adjust. <laughs> yep. <laughs> it, 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 particularly when you're talking about uh, nationals, and, and some judges may dispute this, but I think every panel that I've been on, part of what gets done during the conversation period is you start thinking about what team was a little stronger than another and where does this team fit regarding all the other teams we saw earlier in the day so in in that respect i, I do think judges will be able to adjust scores and and have to be able to adjust scores during the day in part because this the numbers are not platonic ideals there's no hey that's an eight I, and, and I recognize that, that we're probably going to do some of that tonight, but there's not really an eight. There really is a number compared to what we have already seen. So I, I certainly hope that folks will have the opportunity to adjust scores as days progress, because particularly at the national competition, that's really what we're doing. And, and that was a big, a big issue that we talked about. That is, at the national competition, it's a competition. 
you know, at state competitions, I'll give advice to students in terms of, hey, think about X, Y, or Z if you're going on, et cetera. There's no going on after the national competition, and it's really largely about who scores what and who wins what. So that's that's kind of the way we look myopically at the rubric when thinking about nationals while recognizing that it also gets used for other purposes at other at other times. Thanks, Hank. Um, I'll, I'll add one more. I'll ahead. add one more note about feedback, which is that um, piggybacking on what Hank said, you can give constructive feedback in areas for growth and still give an eight, nine, or ten. So just again, you know, this harkens back to this being used as an instructional tool. You know, teachers are go always going to be telling their students to do more and try, you know, consider this, consider that. The learning never stops. Just like democracy, it's messy, it just keeps going. Um, but as a judge, you know, you may want to give them that feedback, but that could still mean that they have scored top score. So it's not like you have to land on one side of each category or the other. It's a both and. Um, and it's where you feel like you want to, you know, support their their learning and growth the most. That's where you'll focus your comments. Thanks, Donna. That's helpful. Um, and that's actually perfect. I know the slide that we've had up here um, is referencing the comment sections. And um, yes, we've, we've chatted about this quite a bit. But one thing that we are aware of and we know that the state coordinators are aware of as well is that it takes time for you to be able to jot down useful feedback. Um, so whether you are scoring on the rubric sheet itself, or if you are submitting scores electronically later, um, we are all aware at the different levels of competition that you all need time to be able to provide that. So whether it's more time between the hearings uh, so that you have time to write down immediate thoughts or making sure you have plenty of time at the end to enter your uh, your feedback electronically, that's a big a big part of this. So, um, for those of us who organize competitions, we certainly have that in mind. All right. So um, we're hoping we'll see how much we can do of this. We were hoping to at least watch um, an example hearing that the this kid's opening statement for one and. You know, again, to have you all keep the rubric up in front of you if you're able to access it um, and just listen to these particular students give their opening statement just with an ear to those different categories that we've been talking about, um, just to kind of prime your thinking in that way. Um, and then as you're listening to also ask you to think of maybe two to three potential follow up questions that you would ask related to those different categories. So be it evidence, analysis, or application. So um, we will go ahead and listen to these students from uh, 2018. Give me just a minute to get to the right spot on the video. I mean, the intros are fun, but we can skip those for today. You question number three. If I were king, I would not allow people to go about burning the American flag. However, we have a First Amendment which says that the right to free speech shall not be abridged. Burning the flag is a form of expression. Speech doesn't just mean written or oral work. Burning a flag is a symbol of ex that expresses an idea. Do you agree or disagree with Leo's opinion? Why and why not? How has the meaning of free speech, as defined by the courts, changed over time? Should the government ban websites that advocate hate speech towards ethnic, racial, or religious groups? Why or why not? What, if any, restrictions uh, the courts have placed on freedom of expression? Which of these restrictions do you support or oppose? Explain your position. You may begin. In 1999, Vietnam War veteran Gary May testified to the Senate Judiciary Committee. As offensive and painful as flag burning is, I believe that those dissenting voices need to be heard. The freedom of expression, even when it hurts, is the truest test of our dedication to the belief that we have that right. We agree with Justice Scalia that speech doesn't just mean written or oral words. Burning a flag is a symbol that expresses an idea, as held in Texas v. Johnson. 
Most significantly, the context in which a symbol is used for purposes of expression is key, for the context gives meaning to the symbol. After the Civil War, the American flag was revered as an incorruptible national image. As philosopher Paul Tillich wrote, the flag participates in the power and dignity of the nation from which it stands. An attack on the flag is felt as an attack on the group in which it is acknowledged. Because of the symbolic nature of the flag, burning it is one of the most effective ways to convey an individual's political beliefs. And therefore, in these circumstances, expression should receive the highest protection. The meaning of free speech, as defined by the courts, has changed over time. It initially served as a tool to protect spoken or written words. It has evolved into a powerful means for individual expression, including nonverbal conduct, as demonstrated under Tinker v. Des Moines. Additionally, the medium in which speech occurs has changed as a result of the digital age. In Packingham v. North Carolina, the Supreme Court deemed the internet the modern public square. This, this opinion furthered the debate about the government's role in regulating speech online. The government should not ban websites that advocate hate speech towards racial, ethnic, or religious groups for two main reasons. First, hate speech is protected under the First Amendment, as demonstrated by the Supreme Court in cases such as National Socialist Party v. Skokie, Snyder v. Phelps, and Rad v. St. Paul. Additionally, the term hate speech is vague, overbroad, and subjective, and can be easily abused by the government. Second, self-regulation of the internet is the most effective manner in which to protect consumers, implementing the free market theory originated by John Stuart Mill. For example, after the 2017 riots in Charlottesville, Virginia, the domain GoDaddy banned the website Daily Storer because of its promotion of white supremacy and neo-Nazism. Additionally, people will choose what websites to browse or ignore based on their content. Recently, with the release of the Facebook scandal concerning Cambridge Analytica, Nearly 20 million people deleted their accounts, including billionaire Elon Musk, who removed the Tesla and SpaceX accounts. As philosopher Fred S. Siebert wrote, let all with something to say be free to express themselves. The true and sound will survive. Government should keep out of the battle and not weigh the odds in favor of one side or the other. The Supreme Court has approved of government restrictions on freedom of expression in the following instances inciting imminent lawless action, as demonstrated in Brandenburg v. Ohio, fighting words, as in Chaplin's TV, New Hampshire, defamation, as shown in New York Times v. Sullivan, obscenity, as in Miller v. California, and true threats, as defined in Virginia v. Black. Expression may also be restricted when a state has a compelling governmental interest which outweighs the individual's interest, or when the government neutrally regulates the time, place, and manner of the expression. We support the restrictions the court has placed on freedom of expression, except for fighting words, as fighting words too closely resembles hate speech. In Chaplinsky v. New Hampshire, Chaplinsky merely expressed his opinions by calling a police officer a damned racketeer and a damned fascist. Freedom of expression is essential to our liberty, as stated by Justice Douglas in Terminal v. Chicago. A function of free speech under our system of government is to invite dispute. It may indeed serve its high purpose when it induces a condition of unrest or even stirs people to anger. Thank you. Okay. Um, so if you'd like, please go ahead and put in the chat um, which types of questions you might ask to kick off the follow-up period. Great. Rebecca, do you support the limitation issued through a gag order imposed on former President Trump? Why or why not? Excellent speech question. And what, what type of question or which category would you, when you listen to the students respond, would you be evaluating them on? Primarily, it will definitely cross over into others, depending on how good they are. <laughs> it would be both analysis and understanding and application. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Chris, Ooh. how would you counter Justice Jackson's dissent in Terminello that the Constitution is not a suicide pact? This is such a Chris Kavanaugh question, I can't even stand it. <laughs> and what type of question would this one be? Well, I guess it, this would be under analysis because you're looking for that counter that countervailing view. And I would mm -hmm. probably also maybe ask him about uh, Alito's dissent in Snyder v. Phelps, 
because he was the one sole vote against all, allowing that. You know, the idea of where would you draw the line? You know, would you agree with where these justices have said that? Mm -hmm. Chris and Mary, at what point do you feel that the free speech line is crossed into a terrorist threat? How do you feel these lines should be drawn to protect the country? All right. Ooh, there's so many good ones. <laughs> They're really good. <laughs> what political idea is being expressed or communicated by burning a flag? Mm. This makes me want to just do the hearing myself right now. <laughs> uh, Cindy, an application question. What if the government is the entity whose statement leads to a clear and present danger? Yeah, y'all are y'all are 100% on the right track. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is great. Um, and then if you if you think about the uh, like the boilerplate questions that we screen shared, you know, you mentioned in your speech this case. How does this case relate to this concept? So they mentioned a lot of different cases. They definitely did not have time to elaborate on them. So you can definitely, this really gets to, you know, how well did they prepare their speech and how deep did they go in researching to create that speech that they mentioned that case and see how deep they can go in applying it or elaborating on it, um, you know, connecting to something else you might ask them. Okay, great. Uh, so the next thing we wanted to do, and I, I think we have enough time to make this happen. Um, I'd like us to watch the students in the follow-up period and realizing that the students are during doing a follow-up um, six minutes that they're, they're not using the current rubric and may not necessarily be aware of the current categories. Um, let's go ahead and try to apply it anyway. So if we were, participating in this hearing during the follow-up period. Um, this time around, we want to assess how they have done in those follow-up categories um, at the end of the hearing. So we'll can, I ask a quick, can I ask a quick question, yeah, Emily? Ahead. The particular question that was asked with the various parts lead them in very specific directions. Mm -hmm. Would a question for today or for this year likely be less specific to allow them with more of a chance to choose their own adventure. Yes, Hank, absolutely. So we are looking um, to move our questions to a shorter, more concise, but broader kind of question that would allow the students more room to explore different, different avenues to respond. Um, so yes. <laughs> Thank you for bringing that up. Now, the day that you convinced Tim Moore not to start a question with a lengthy quote, I, we may never see that day, but <laughs> we will uh, we will keep our questions concise where we can. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> it's not his fault, though. The founders are, they're not pithy folk. All right, um, to the follow-ups. Um, I want to pick up on one of the last things you talked about. You you say that the the case was uh, revolving around fighting words is wrong. So where would you draw the line? Well, fighting words has actually only been used to restrict freedom of expression in Chaplin's TV New Hampshire. So we think that that exception to freedom of expression should just not exist at all. In addition to this, because it's so close to hate speech and hate speech is such a vague term, there isn't really a place to draw the line, which is why it's an unnecessary restriction. Is there another test that you might use for that? I, I'm just thinking, you know, if, if someone's being made feel threatened or... It... Well, there's a difference between hate speech, truth threats, harassment, or bullying, and there's different criteria for each of these. So truth threats um, under Virginia v. Black would be a person threatening a person with a physical action to harm that person. And harassment is actually a persistent um, occurrence toward the person. So there is a difference between all of these, these three issues. Hate speech is just far more clearly defined in the exceptions, whereas fighting words is just kind of vague, overused, and things like that. So hate speech should just be the main proprietor for that um, restriction. Do you think something like pornography really adds to the marketplace of ideas? 
I would definitely say that the marketplace of ideas is in the eye of the beholder. So I think that everybody's speech is value, including something like pornography. It's whoever the person is and their ideas, they're able, they're when they're able to express that, that is the what the marketplace of ideas means. Also, pornography can be seen as something that is artistic to many people. So that artistic value can be placed as something such as symbolic speech, as also demonstrated in Texas with Johnson. So that speech should also be allowed in the marketplace of ideas because it is a form of expression. I want to kind of backtrack a little bit. We're talking about fighting speech. Where would cyberbullying fly on this spectrum? And how do you anticipate school tackle speech that happens outside the classroom? Well, in our Waco County School District, we actually have a test implemented. It's a three-part test. It is, um, and it basically explains the rules and regulations. So the first part of the test would be harassment. And then the second part would be if it's reoccurring and if it is uninvited. So our school district uses that test to ensure that we don't overcross that line of um, that hate speech and that bullying so they can regulate it properly. Well, it's a really difficult question, actually, because by allowing the school to address cyberbullying that, that occurs outside of school, that's really reaching into the parental side um, that really parents should be dealing with with other parents. So it really depends. I think that it should really be left up to law enforcement and school really should have a hand in what incurs off campus. What about on campus? So what about the gun control walkouts that we've seen um, happening across the country? Should should students be given detention for doing that during school hours? Well, under teacher read and voice, schools have um, a right to regulate the expression that happens in the school if it creates a material and substantial disruption. So schools can definitely choose to say that many people walking out at one time is a disruption of their class and they're going to take actions against it. But I know that our school definitely supported us in walking out and they definitely supported our right to express ourselves that way. But I would agree with what they stated in Tinker v. Des Moines, that students don't lose their constitutional rights at the schoolhouse gate. And I think that things such as the walkout, like that's using your right to assembly. So I think that it's very important to be able to do that in a school environment. Do you think something that's somebody trying to sell something, like in an advertisement, for instance, do you think that that sort of speech aimed towards consumers should be protected the same way that advocating for a political candidate should be? So commercial speech actually has less freedom of speech protections. As shown in Rubin v. Courts, they said that the government only needed to show a substantial government interest in limiting um, commercial speech. So in that way, it has less protections than say symbolic speech or freedom of expression. So should the government be able to tell Facebook what to do with my company's page on Facebook more so than they can, you know, what Cambridge Analytica is doing or what these, these now we know to be fake news outlets we're doing? Should we different tests for Facebook from the government? Sorry for interrupting, but absolutely not. Facebook is a private um, social media platform and it is a private industry. So therefore they should be able to regulate how their consumers and constituents um, speak online. For example, Facebook has regulations in which um, that speech must be conducted. So if they find it obscene or something like that, they're absolutely allowed to take it down. The government has no place in going into social media platforms and um, telling them what they can and cannot do. However, I would say with the recent Facebook scandal, this was really a consent issue in which consumers, when they did sign up for Facebook, consented to a privacy um, agreement, which allowed Facebook to release this data. So I really think Congress needs to come in and create some act or some legislation that simplifies the terms and conditions so the average person will know what they're getting into and what rights they're going to be giving up. Do you, do you think an outright lie should be protected by the First Amendment? So in U.S. v. Alvarez, they actually ruled that an outright lie is protected, and in this case, a man was telling everyone he got the purple medal armor or honor in the army, and that was a, a lie. And I think it should be protected because everyone has a right to say what they want to say, even if it might not. However, this doesn't include things like perjury and fraud. Those are also exceptions under the First Amendment where you are not allowed to lie. So I think that under only certain circumstances that it's okay. Let's give yourselves a round of applause. Okay. So we let's uh, just go through the, the different categories then for follow up. So, how do y'all feel that they did with regards to evidence? And you can even give us the score one to uh, in that one to ten range if you feel like it. 
I'd like to ask uh, a question of Hank directly before we get into that. As I was listening to all this, and, and, and again, it's outside my, I mean, all this is con law stuff, so I'm a little fuzzy. But Hank, I, I'm having a hard time parsing out when they were analyzing and when they were applying. Um, is is that uh, uh, how how do uh, can you can you help me maybe sort through some some ways to distinguish between their analysis and their applying? Yeah, I, I suspect that what may happen is over time judges will ask questions that go more to those issues. That that is a asking a question that calls for application and seeing how they apply you know, will be the issue or that ask the question of, well, okay, how did the court reach its true threats doctrine? You know, so that you can sort of separate, well, what do they know and what does the constitution mean on this issue and how does it apply? I suspect that that's going to occur. So it's, it's a little tougher with this one because of the style of the question. Yeah. Uh, I also suspect that what will happen is as folks start to, to focus on that process, their openings will likely start to also track, well, what is the Constitution? What's the constitutional basis? How does the constitutional base, what does the constitutional basis mean and how does it apply? That I suspect is what will also happen moving forward. But it's a, it's a, good, it's a good question. Yeah, thank you, Tim. So, I mean, in terms of the evidence category, they were real strong. The young lady, especially on the far left, mm -hmm. she had a case for pretty much yeah. every bully through matter. Um, so that that category, I think, is probably fairly fairly clear. Um, and and thank you to to Hank for kind of parsing out a little bit the analysis, understanding versus application. Um, some of the application responses were the ones where they were trying to apply it for their own um, settings, right? So the school, their schools, um, three-part analysis of what constituted cyber threat. Um, so some of those examples do fit more cleanly into application, but you raise a great point. Um, other I'd like to, yeah, yeah, I just wanted to, so in my note taking, uh, Cindy, um, I, for analyzing, if the question begins with why, I see it as analyzing. If the question begins with how, I see it as application. Does that make sense? I hesitate to say that's a hundred percent true all the time, but I think no. It's but but I think as a general yeah, guideline, it's a good place to start. Yeah, and um, one of the things that we were thinking about, and I think I put it on a slide later, one of the things we might recommend to you all as judges, um, since there are usually three of you, that perhaps one of you might think about, I'm going to be the evidence question asker, and one of you might be, I'm going to be the analysis understanding asker, and one of you might be the application asker, so that you know you all are, are automatically kind of attuned to the type of question that you might um, do the follow-ups for. So not something that you know if you all just want to do whatever you want to do, that's okay too. But if if it helps, especially in this this early phase of working through the rubric, that's certainly a um, an avenue you can take. I, I think one of the issues uh, between analysis and application is we want students to show depth and breadth. And uh, application lends itself much more to breadth and analysis lends itself much, much more to depth. And so it's difficult in the rapid fire questions that they were getting here, I think as Hank alluded to, um, that it was tough to really see the analysis because you didn't get a chance to pick apart the, the plethora of case law that they were dropping on us. Um, so I think therein lies the issue. And I, I think some people in the chat talked about that. And I think, Emily, you just kind of alluded to that as as a panel of judges, you might want to think about uh, who's going to be the analysis by doing a little deeper dive in, in the six minutes you have to maybe an example they bring up versus, well, you know, how does that case law apply to your school as they as they did? Because their application was really good, but uh, it was a little tougher on the analysis, I think. 
Thank you. That that's another fantastic way to look at it. And um, yeah, I I would agree with you there. All right. Um, so I'm going to take a look at Tim's question here. If we're separating out opening statement, are we expecting new evidence analysis and application? Can it be repeated to count for full credit for the non-opening statement pieces? You know, Tim, I would suspect if they are building on something that they have put in their opening statement, then sure, then it definitely counts. Like a lot of the students do that by strategy anyway, right? They're going to they're gonna lay down some breadcrumbs and hope that you pick them up and ask them further questions about it. So yeah, absolutely. If, if they wanna build on those instances that they have put forward, great. If they are somehow repeating verbatim what they said in the opening without somehow expanding upon it, then I would say, well, that's, that's, not, that's not really what we're after here. So tell me more, <laughs> um, but that's a, that's a good question. And it's definitely possible they're going to do some level of analysis um, and they're definitely going to show some evidence in their their opening speech. So then asking them to elaborate on that or to connect what they started to to another concept, I think, is a way to dig into that further. Um, one of my favorite question formulas is asking them to make a connection between something or a concept that they mentioned in their speech with something that's not part of their unit. You know, so what would an, what would an anti-federalist perspective be on this thing that you just said, or right, you know, vice versa? Um, and I think that can really lay the groundwork for how well they can analyze uh, the concepts that they laid out in their speech. I love anti-federalists. Okay. All right, we can definitely talk a little bit more about this, but I do want to make sure there's a couple more things we show you. Um, okay, so. We have created for the students a separate version of the rubric that teachers can give to them when they are introducing the assignment. So this is meant to explain very clearly to the students, what is it that we are asking you to do? So for each of the category, there's a description meant for the student. So for the opening, here is what we expect that you and your classmates will write and deliver a well-organized and clear speech based on the questions from your unit. As a unit team, everybody should be taking part in writing, the, uh, writing as well as delivering the speech, use accurate information from the Constitution, history, and other sources just in front of you. Okay, so each of the categories has this same type of descriptor that is meant to guide the students from the point of assignment to the final product. Um, so that's a resource that we have available on our website and are um, eager to share that around to teachers. We did one of these sessions for teachers several weeks ago, but we uh, walked through that then. All right, so one of the things that you will not find on our version of the rubric is a provided scoring range. And that was a very deliberate decision. As Hank has already mentioned, and I think a lot of you know in practice, it is almost impossible for us to describe what does a six look like? What does an eight look like? What does a nine look like? That's something that is going to be subjective based on the students that you have in front of you at any given time. So we didn't provide a scoring range that we hope will allow you to feel like you have a greater opportunity to provide a score reflective of what you saw the students do. Um, Hank, did you want to add anything to that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, not, not, not too much, just I agree with you. And this was the one where our focus on the, on the score sheet as a score sheet for nationals was most, was clearest. All right, the, the other is that if you, if one goes back and looks at the previous scoring rubric, it's really interesting, but it's really not clear that you can use it in the way that we want it to be used. Because I, I always went back and, and looked at it and it's, a, it's, it's an interesting document, but it doesn't necessarily match up to what we tend to think about. So uh, yeah, that's, that's why we didn't really give a scoring range and, and really the range is Hey, an eight's a little better than a seven. 
What does that mean? Well, in context, it means that the group that got the eight did a little bit better than the group that got the six. And I think we've alluded to this earlier as well, where you should have the opportunity to adjust as you go based on the students that you're seeing. We can discuss this more if you all have questions at the end. Um, but the other item that you will not see is a tiebreaker box. So we have suggested to state coordinators um, to simplify the process of a potential tiebreaker situation. Um, we are suggesting that you all as judges simply rank the teams you saw today. If you saw five teams, then just rank them one, two, three, four, five. Um, if you saw 12 teams at nationals today, one through 12. Um, so those are um, those are the only numbers that you need to then provide to the state coordinator or for the national final score team. It's just the rank rather than attempting to derive a number out of 100. All right. And there's a whole lot of information here about what if, what if. So Donald Lanier, who is our national nationals scoring team chief whiz guy who has helped about 12 different states <laughs> do their competitions. Um, tying is incredibly unlikely. So I just wanted to have this few slides in here to demonstrate that the statistical probability is in fact quite small. Um, Chris asks a fabulous question. Do we rank as an individual or as a panel? I would suggest that you rank as an individual. So um, that allows for there to be, you know, 18 ranks as opposed to six ranks if you're in a, a state situation. Um, yeah, to answer your question. All right. <laughs> oh, hey, hey, Emma, let me add just one more thing. Yeah. We had talked in our discussions about also not having a score range so that people would feel free to use more of the range. Because uh, that was another piece. If you look at the old rubrics, it really was very hard to go much below, I'd say, seven because of the way that the lower ranges were described. Um, here, with no guide, a little bit different. As long as you are consistent with you score over time or, or over your grouping, it will, largely speaking, uh, take care of itself, although I recognize that there are certain very specific circumstances where you could run. Yeah, and Carl, um, he mentions in the chat that they used to use the scoring range to keep us um, from a deviation problem. So in some states and at nationals, there are not necessarily rules, but practices in place where if there is a deviation of greater than a set point value, between judges on a single panel, then that usually involves a separate conversation with the person who is the head of scoring, um, whether it's at the state level or the national level. And usually the conversation is based on whether you were consistent across all the teams you saw, or if there looks like there is an, a scoring aberration that you were somehow giving everybody a, you know, a perfect score when the rest of your panel thought that this was kind of a mid-range team. Oh, then, then that usually involves a separate conversation with the score team. But um, I will defer to the states to dictate what, what that DDA frame should be. And just as a side note, we did do the exercise of trying to create a score range with descriptors. And it was like a 17 page document. And then we didn't even like it, you know, like we could not land on how we could adequately and accurately describe different levels of performance with the criteria. It seemed uh, inauthentic and, you know, creating more barriers and work and confusion than, than not. So we realized this is a change. Uh, it's a de facto, it's a de jure change, but not a de facto change, because I don't know how well that scoring range was used to Hank's point earlier. So you're all, we're good. You'll be good. You'll be fine. <laughs> you know how to do this. <laughs> so real quickly, the timeline moving forward, um, you know, we rolled out the rubric this fall. Um, it will be in use 
for most of the state level competitions this fall. Um, we are definitely going to use it at the national finals. And then after we have a year's worth of feedback, um, then we can certainly consider lessons learned from field use and we can consider um, how we may wish to further refine it. But just wanted to give you that timeline. Um, and then of course, you all are stakeholders, the state coordinators are stakeholders, the teachers are stakeholders, students are stakeholders. So we are open to your feedback as you road test this. And we would really hope that you feel like you can reach out to us and let us know like, hey, this, this part works really well. This part is still kind of confusing. Um, that helps us know, you know, hey, do we need to do a different kind of training? Do we need to provide a, a different kind of supporting document? Um, all of that is useful information to us. So please let us know. And I also will note that state coordinators are able to make changes to the format of the rubric if it makes better sense for them. Um, they've also been giving us requests. So for example, the, um, the version that we showed you, the, the colorful blue and yellow one, um, is laid out in landscape format. And some of the state coordinators requested that we have a portrait mode version that is easier to print. So we also have a portrait version. Um, so that's a thing. One of the state coordinators um, requested a, a spreadsheet version. So we now have a spreadsheet version. So some of them have, have tweaked it so that it, it works for what they need it to do. And that's totally fine with us. So if you see a slightly different version out in the world, that's okay. <laughs> um, and, and we've encouraged the state coordinators to share with us their um, whatever modifications they were requesting. Mm -hmm. so, I think you all probably know the dates for the, the competitions at the national level. All of your states will of course be different, um, but the national finals is April 13th to 15th and the invitational is 10th to um, virtually. So we look forward to seeing lots of you there. Okay, and with that, um, we do have some time for Q&A if folks are don't mind sticking around. But otherwise, thank you for giving us uh, quite a bit of time this evening. We hope this was helpful to walk through this with you. But um, again, we look forward to your feedback and wish you the best of luck with your state competitions. So thanks, thanks so much for everything you do for We the People. You all are amazing. <laughs>